Yeah. Amber had us on twice. Great. She had us. On We're good. Have a great meeting, all. Yeah. At the end. At the end. Yeah, we can. Okay. Perfect. We'll add that. All righty. So let's go. Are you ready, Shirley? All righty. So welcome community. It is a Tuesday evening and this is our general council meeting. Um, Chief Hill sends his regrets. Same with uh, Councillor Sherry Lynn Hill. We have Councillor Hazel and Helen who will be joining us after an event that they are attending um, over at Mont Hill. And so with that, let's start with um, the adoption of the agenda. Is there anything to add to tonight's agenda? Right. Uh, yeah, I just have two announcements to make. Okay. And we will actually be adding on the drinking water, the settlement for the drinking water. So um, I'm hopeful, Brooke, that Rod is able or is in the waiting room and able to join us. So with that, we have three additions. Do I have a mover to accept tonight's agenda? Moved by Audrey, seconded by Nathan. All in favor? That motion is carried. We have two delegations. So I see Christina Zahar Zahar is with us. And so Christina, welcome. You um, have the floor for about five, 10 minutes. You're gonna do your presentation on the production you want to do about the dish, uh, one dish, one spoon. And so I'll give the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, being able to present. So yes, um, I am the production manager for the television series, One Dish, One Spoon, which is a show that we make with uh, Chef Tanya Brandt and her sister, Dakota. Um, we are in production for season two, but I'm currently working on the clearances for season one. And we shot um, uh, an episode, episode four, which is called Water is Life. We shot that in June of 2022 at the Six Nations Water Treatment Plant. Um, and I'm not quite sure why we didn't get a location agreement at the time. I wasn't involved at the time, but um, that's something we're looking to get signed um, as well. We see a few images that would belong to, I imagine, Six Nations Public Works, um, including the Public Works sign with the phone number, um, a sign on the building where we follow uh, Tanya and her father, Richard, as he goes to fill up water because he hauls water every week. You'll see the uh, water department sign. And then uh, there's one more. Oh, yes. And then the Six Nations water treatment plant. Um, where we shot with Steve Lickers, who gave us a tour of the plant and talks about um, the scope of what the water treatment plant does and what the hopes are for the future. And um, it's a lot to address the uh, water crisis on Six Nations and how that affects a number of the homes in Six Nations. So we're hoping that you will allow us to show that footage uh, on camera by signing a uh, material release. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, mm -hmm. So I will read the recommendation so the community is aware of what Christina is asking for. That the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council sign the location agreement form granting permission to film on Six Nations of the Grand River and the Six Nations water plant and production material release form to allow one dish, one spoon to use the following images from Six Nations of the Grand River, the Six Nations Public Works sign and phone number, Six Nations department name on a plaque and an image of the water plant software. So that is a recommendation that is in front of everybody this evening. Do I have a mover moved by Nathan? Do I have a seconder? Greg, any questions for Christina? Greg? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks, Christina, um, for the, the request. Um, uh, when do you think the um, all the filming will be completed? And uh, just to just to give a timeline, this actually was completed last year in okay. uh, June of 2022, and so we're just putting on the final touches on the episodes. And so I'm I'm looking for sort of um, the stuff retroactively because I'm unsure of why I don't have a copy of 
all of these signed documents, which just might have gotten lost in in the shuffle last year. So it will be, be it'll be viewed soon then. It should be viewed very fairly soon on APTN. Yes, we're getting ready to deliver to the network in October, and then they'll put it on their schedule. And I'm not certain if they have determined a date as yet. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, um, the motion has been uh, moved and and passed. We awesome. passed. Thank you. I appreciate it. And so we don't need second reading. We do. <laughs> okay all righty so with that christina thank you so much for being with us and uh we look forward to watching your episode on aptn take care thank you so much take care okay if brooke we can have clarissa and well zach is with us or claire oh you're both online okay and so for council and community, we had uh, Clarissa and Zach present to us two weeks ago in regards to the um, Indigenous health legislation work that's being done. And so there was a little bit more follow up work that needed to be done, and that was deferred till tonight. So Claire, Zach, I'll give it over to you to update us on what has transpired since, and then we'll have some discussion. Over to you. Sure, sounds good. Thank you, you know, everyone. Um, yeah, so we were able to put the recommendations forward that were brought by Chief and Council at our last presentation we gave. Um, Claire was able to do a lot of work on her end, gathering community opinions uh, around the legislation. So I'll hand it over to her and she has a brief presentation to share as well. Uh, you're on mute as well, too, Claire. Okay, sorry about that. We got lost in the screen. Um, hello. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me back. Um, as it was perfectly explained, we are coming back um, to revisit um, what Canada is proposing for the Indigenous health legislation. Um, so I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, um, but we did do a lot of work on engaging community, um, as well as drafting the band council resolution that we will review together. Um, and then also working with the chief's office for the official um, letter to be drafted and sent. So in terms of what has happened, so taking a stance of just a community engagement first. Um, I wanted to work kind of dually and share information as well as collect feedback from community um, all at once. So what I'm about to share with you is some preliminary data results. Um, keep in mind there's a collection period of data for just, just over one week. Um, so I was able to create a survey um, that was to collect opinions and then the SNGR Facebook and Instagram pages had posted the flyer and video link. Um, the Healthy Six Nay Facebook and Instagram pages, same with the flyer and video link. Um, and there were advertisements put in Turo Times and Turtle Island News uh, last week. The Chiefs radio update made mention of the informational video and flyer on September 22nd. Uh, we did do communications helped with a lot of the central comms and we sent an email to all of council staff as well um, the well di acting director of health services and well-being department jesse was able to kind of like endorse and send an email to those staff as well um, and then this information was also captured in the news section of the new sngr app um, and then lastly this was also shared uh, on the overall website so from all of this, um, I was able to collect survey responses, um, and I sort of supplemented that with a bit of a social media content analysis. Um, so I was able to analyze all of those interactions that happened on social media, comments, likes, shares, those types of things, and the insights that those are able to tell us. So in total, 
um, responses and interactions that were analyzed with community members is 191. Um, so that's representative of the sample size for all of the information that I'm now able to share with you. So from the survey, it did pose a very um, straightforward question with the hopes of getting a straightforward answer. Um, so the question was, do you agree with Canada's proposed changes to Indigenous health legislation? That's listed at the top there. And this pie chart displays the results. So we can see that 82% of respondents had indicated no, um, they do not support Canada in the passing of this new legislation. Well, 18% indicated they didn't have enough information to form a position. Uh, you'll notice there's no gray, meaning there were zero responses submitted that indicated, yes, I support Canada in the passing of this new legislation. So I think that is one of the really good uh, key takeaways. Um, so to try and uh, supplement that and make it a little bit more meaningful as well, um, this is where the um, open-ended responses were able to come in. So I did make myself available for um, questions and uh, verbal sharing of feedback for anybody that reached out. So I was able to conduct three of those one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then there were also open-ended responses submitted as the survey as additional comments, as well as some Facebook um, comments that were open-ended based responses. So of all of this data, I conducted what's called a thematic um, kind of coding. And so I was able to look at all of the full responses that were provided, um, decide uh, kind of like code them as certain themes and what the themes were most present. So each one can have multiple themes, of course. Um, so just to uh, visualize that, I created what is called a word cloud here. Um, so the bigger the word is, that indicates the more times that was mentioned by community in a response or interaction. So just for example, we can see that number one, the very biggest would be do not agree. So in through their interactions, that was what was indicated the most, the sentiment that was most prevalent. And then secondly, we can see really large as well is community driven. And this is really important to uh, inform the decision on the BCR, I believe, because we can see that um, unsurprisingly community would like the approach to be community driven. Um, so there are a whole bunch of other priorities that were listed and came up and they're all included in the word cloud. I don't think it's necessary to go through each one of them right now per se, but it is interesting that it kind of gave us a starting point for the next steps. And we can see what some of the priorities for health um, are when looking to the future and starting to engage with community later on. Uh, so for example, distinctions approaches. So ensuring that the unique reality is realized for this community as well um, access and culture and resource management. Um, so just to kind of like reiterate the next steps um, and what we can expect. So one, the next steps that were discussed in the previous meeting was event council resolution. So we will go through that in the next slide. Um, and then the Chief Mark Hill will work alongside the Chief's office to ensure that official letter is sent. Um, so the deadline for feedback was Friday, um, and we have already worked with the Chief's office in ensuring that Indigenous Services Canada knows that a position is coming this week from Six Nations. Um, so then lastly, just again to provide a little attempt to provide more clarity to the process, um, the government of Canada is going to begin drafting the bill. Um, so if they decide to include an opt-out or exclusion clause, which is what the band council resolution is speaking to, um, then that would really mean that SNGR would have the option to opt out and it could be explored and the implications at that point, not that it would be a decision to be opting out right now per se. Um, and then also, of course, they could decide to not include an opt-out or exclusion clause, 
Um, and then that would require further political advo advocacy um, and going straight to the minister. Um, so that is really all the information that I have, have to share in terms of updates and what we've done since last week. Um, I did just kind of type this up. If it's helpful to leave it on the screen, I can. If not, please uh, let me know. But thank you for taking the time. Okay, thank you, Claire. And uh, I appreciate that you put the recommendation on the screen. And so I don't have to read it. The community can actually see it. And so at this time, I open it up for discussion. Greg? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Claire. Um, I had the opportunity, well, I was invited um, to a, a Zoom meeting uh, concerning this uh, about a, since your last presentation, uh, Claire. So I, I don't really recall why I was invited, but I was invited there. The, um, but some of the issues that you just presented, um, other uh, First Nations communities had concerns about as well. The, um, the consultation, uh, you know, timing of the issue, some, some were not consulted, uh, such as us, and that this seemed to be being pushed through. Uh, there was another doctor there on the, on the call that um, seemed to think that this still had a hint of colonialism and how the um, Indigenous, Indigenous Services Canada uh, was going to put this through um, anyway um, and sticking to their time frame. Um, the other thing, too, was uh, there was a concern um, from one of the members that um, there wasn't enough cultural awareness built into the um, legislation um, and that uh, that most that was some of the legislation should be re reworked. Um, the other thing too is um, there was no mention of um, of the funding and funding issue, and how that would be um, guaranteed if uh, if you did not, um, I guess, agree with this and sign up to this uh, legislation. Um, there was some concern about that as well. So a lot of those issues that our community brought up uh, were brought up on that on that Zoom call. Thanks, Greg. Any uh, follow up to Greg's comments? Just update. Is there any other comments from the councillors? So we have a recommendation in front of us. Um, what do we want to do? Nathan? Uh, I'll move with a slight friendly amendment. Um, where the last line it says, and specifically that Six Nations request opt in and opt out uh, exclusion clauses. After that, I'd like to add, or any other legal or political remedies that may arise. I just don't want us, and, and I think the, the presentation and the recommendations uh, support that because, you know, going to the minister and I just don't want to chop our foot off just at the inclusion clauses. So I'll move with that amendment if everyone's cool with that. Okay, so we have the amendment. Greg, do you have a comment? Uh, just have a question for Claire. Um, because this uh, this seemed to be a take it or leave it, right? This it's this the way they're approaching it is that um, um, I wouldn't say it's it, it appears to be it's almost threatening in a way. That if you know you don't you don't get involved, that you know you're going to be left out, and then there's there, you're going to have problems for your community. Is is that is am I not correct in in having that type of feeling? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Greg. I think I think that's a I'm not that far off from from your sentiment there. I think um, even more interesting, they don't even give the option to leave it. Uh, it's not even really take it or leave it. It's kind of take it and deal with it. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question, but um, I'm not not finding myself straying from your comment. Great, thank you. I'll second that. Okay, so we have the motion moved by Nathan, second by Greg, and Melba has a comment. Yes, I do. That's very interesting, Greg, uh, that you were at a meeting where you mentioned the funding and culture was not included. 
And I think that's very important based on the culture that we practice here at Six Nations and we employ people who are um, in place to include the culture, such as our medicines, as well as the ceremonies. So I think that's really important. So hopefully things will certainly improve as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melba. And so we have a motion. So we'll go to the vote. All in favor? Does anybody oppose? Hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, so thank you, Claire and Zach, for working on um, the recommendation and reaching out to community. And so um, we'll go from there. Thank you, yeah. thank you Council. Okay, so let's, um, I'm going to bring Rod in as a delegation. And so, Rod, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. Um, today, over the last couple of days, we've had some inquiries in regards to the drinking water, the settlement. And so, Rod, if I can give you the floor to give an update to community of uh, where we stand with that um, application. Yes. So uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for um, the time. I know we didn't go through the agenda review team process for this for this particular issue. There had been some past briefing notes and um, updates to the environmental task force on on the portfolio on the, the drinking water portfolio. Um, but um, I guess we were the, the inquiries that we were getting from communities is they just wanted to know the status of um, Six Nations being considered as an impacted First Nation. Uh, when they go on to the, the National First Nations Claims website, um, Six Nations is not listed there. So in the application form, and I know we've discussed this at council previously, I think the, the total, there's 22 pages in that, that document. So you can fill it out online. So we had heard that there are some community um, households that have filled out the application and they sent it in before the first deadline. Um, the deadline was extended by one year. So I think it's coming up again in March. Um, and there was some confusion around um, a community wide, wide boil advisory, boil water advisory versus an individual boil water advisory. And then <clears throat> it, it, then it also um, kind of defaulted to drinking water advisory. So in that application process, um, and I would, probably have to leave it officially to the chief's officer to Tammy to provide um, a more formal update as to what the correspondence was from the claims uh, office. But myself, uh, uh, Dwayne Jacobs and Sarah Curley Smith, we did provide, uh, compile some evidence and uh, we prepared uh, an affidavit and uh, kind of like an, a cover letter with some evidence of um, boil water advisories um, for the community over the decade. So the claims period is from 1995 to 2021. Um, we knew forthright going down this path that we probably wouldn't meet the, the settlement criteria, which indicates that you have to be on a boil water advisory for more than one year. So in all those instances where the people in Ashwigan that get their water piped um, through the distribution system and the water treatment plant, um, there were there, there were certainly boil water advisories over the decades, but they didn't ever um, exceed a one-year threshold, which was a requirement through the settlement agreement. But what we had been advocating um, concurrently, and that's where it seemed to have got a lot of confusion, is uh, for the vast majority of the community that relies on groundwater and they're on a, a well, they would actually meet the criteria. So leading up to all of the, the um, public um, presentations from the from the various law firms I think OKT and Deloitte um, and I think um, uh, Chief Harry Laforme as well AFN had um, information sessions and the Chiefs of Ontario had information sessions and the questions would get posed all the time um, if, it, if, a, if a First Nation community is not on the impacted community list can individuals if they meet the criteria still submit an application? And the answer consistently was yes, they can. So what we've tried to establish is that yes, indeed, there are uh, the vast majority of households that have had to rely on groundwater and well water for generation upon generation, that 
there's a number of circumstances um, unique to Six Nations whereby that drinking water advisory could never be lifted. And so what we did is we tried to craft a, a document um, that demonstrated um, from a source, a, a source drinking water protection perspective in that there's no environmental protection uh, regime or process or regulatory monitoring and reporting for everybody that's on a well. There's a self-serve um, thing that you can do through, it was formerly through New Directions, but um, you can call up the health service, public health, and they will come out in, or you can collect the sample yourself and it, it will send it to a provincial lab and it'll tell you whether you have bacterial contamination, E. coli or coliform. And it'll tell you whether you, you should drink it or not drink it or boil it or whatnot. So that's in place. So there are gonna be um, households across the community that meet that boil water advisory because so you say, so you, you test your well one week, and if you don't test it on a weekly basis, there's no guarantee that you boil the water or you add it. Like in some instances, Health Canada's advice was pour a bottle of bleach down your well. well okay, you do that once, then we have a heavy rainstorm and the rain goes over a pasture where there's cows grazing. There's no, there can never be any assurances that E. coli and coliform and that one strain that killed those people in Walkerton and what, they, what they're seeing out in Calgary now, it is a real threat and it's been referenced in various um, consulting reports over the years. So because of that fact that we don't have ongoing regulatory rigorous monitoring, there can be no assurances from anybody drinking well water that it's safe from day to day or week to week or month to month. So that was the premise behind the, the letter. It again, it was from a source drinking water perspective. So all of those recharge areas across the community, um, whether it's through groundwater, um, spring sources or aquifers. Um, a lot of the wellheads need to be upgraded. They don't have a bourbon proof lid. They're not properly graded. Um, there's agricultural runoff, non-point sources of pollution. There's other sources that could come in from contaminated soil that's been imported to the community. Um, the other one is we have over 200 abandoned gas wells that have yet to be uh, properly decommissioned and assessed, whether they're providing um, contamination to to groundwater and deep drilled wells. So I think we came up with about maybe seven or eight um, reasons as to why um, it's it's imperative that the, the drinking water for Six Nations as a community-wide uh, advisory remain in place. It's just that whether it's, we just, we just can't, no one can give any assurances that from day to day, week to week, month to month, that their well water's not contaminated because we just, the problem, the, the the um the rigor is just not there. So that's the I think I I'm not sure if Tammy um put that in the Dropbox. I did send it to the task force um just this morning. So um it probably the full council probably hasn't seen it. But what what happened after that is I think it went to um legal counsel. They took a look at it and they made some edits and refined it a little bit and tried to align it with some of the parameters of the class settlement. Uh, and just it's a basically an attestation letter from on, on the chief signature, basically saying that um, we will attest that yes, we do have drinking water advisories that have been in place um, that proceed the claim start period, which is November nineteen ninety or October nineteen ninety five to twenty twenty one, and they remain to this day. So that's the nature of the letter, um, and we we thought uh, the thinking is that um, if if there's households that are planning to submit an application before the next deadline after Christmas of 20 coming up that they could attach this attestation letter and it would be official. So the whole premise behind class settlements is that you don't, individuals don't have to get their own lawyers. They don't have to like they, it's called like a blanket um, acknowledgement where you have to, you do have to have a, a guarantee or you have to testify that what you're putting in your application is true. But for the most part, you don't have to have, extensive individual evidence. So we're hoping that this, this community-wide blanket letter um, from chief and council will, will be suffice um, sufficient enough for the claim settlement to properly assess and rightly assess um, any applications that come from uh, people that live on Six Nations that have been dealing with water safety and security issues uh, for generations upon generations. So that's kind of it in a, in a nutshell, maybe I'll just leave it there and if there's any questions. Perfect. That was a good background to our 
uh, history with the water situation at Six Nations. And so thank you, Rod, for doing that. And um, we have the uh, support letter. I think a few of us have been able to review it. Um, so Greg has a question and then we'll uh, go to, I guess, accepting it for information. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, so just to be clear, um, like the water testing is not a strict requirement, um, like in order for our members to qualify for their, uh, or to be included in that water class action settlement. Is that correct? Well, they do. There is a, a spot on one of the pages where it says how long have how long has the drinking water advisory been in effect? And what we had told people for the first intake and what we're telling people now is that you can put the full duration. You can, if you're, I guess if you're, if you're not in the village of Ashwigan and you're not on a cistern and you have a well, you can put in there and that's all they're asking for. They're not asking for, oh, can you please uh, provide us with um, something from Peter Hill or before him, it was the late Paul Strohack saying that you can't drink, do not consume your water, do not use it or do, or boil it. There's um, likely people within the community that do have, um, that they got their well water tested on a yearly basis and they will will have letters um, from Health Canada, from either Paul Strohack or Peter Hill saying, um, boil your water, or do not use it. Um, what we're suggesting is that the the background behind this cover this blanket cover letter is there won't there won't be a need for that there you will need to have a, a guarantor um, witness you um, signing this so that you're basically um, vouching for yourself um, that what you're putting in the form is true and that you've you've encountered um, uh, water hardships which is the, the basis behind this class settlement um, and then it's prorated, I think, as well. So um, even though it's from 1995 to 2021, the statute of limitations um, only will compensate, I think, the last 13 years. I'll have to go back and look at it. But um, to your question, Councillor, Greg, is yes, at, at this point, it doesn't look like you individual households need to dig into their archives or ask for a reprint. Um, we're hoping that this blanket cover letter will be sufficient enough. And it's pretty, when you read it, it's pretty compelling. It's, it's, this wouldn't be like the circumstances that we face would probably not be acceptable off reserve. Uh, and just in terms of there being so much uncertainty about the quality of the water that you're drinking, you, we can just, we can't, you can't take risks. So for the, for the bacterial contamination, there can be no bacteria whatsoever. It has to be zero. The number of colonies for E. coli has to be zero. Uh, before you can drink that water, so um, that was that, that was the the premise behind the the blanket cover letter. Um, again, if people get their applications in now, we have heard that the legal team from uh, the settlement office will call up households and say you're missing this or you're missing that or you didn't get your guarantee guarantor to sign here. So they they seem to be entertaining. Uh, or accepting applications from Six Nations households. So that's a good thing. And so that um, that's where we're at right now. Thanks, uh, Rod, just to follow up. Um, yeah, the um, I've been encouraging everyone to fill out those forms and send them in. Um, I wasn't quite sure about the, uh, the chief's, uh, the letter from the chief's office, but that'll clarify a lot of issues. The, um, I think that, um, and we've also, I've got some feedback as well that, uh, yeah, the claims office has um, acknowledged that they've um, made their application. Um, but like I said, the, uh, they may require the, um, the, the letter from the chief's office as well. Um, one other thing too, and when is the, when is the, the deadline? When is that, uh, that cutoff date? Um, just looking here now, because like I mentioned, it it got extended. I think it's March it's March twenty twenty four. So they gave a one year extension from from the the original um, first deadline, and it, uh, yeah, it's actually in some of the papers as well. I don't have the exact date uh, in front of me, but it's I'm, I'm thinking that it's March. So it's coming up um, in a few months' time here. So um, great, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Greg. So do I have any other um, questions for Rod? Melva? Yeah, Rod, do you think it would be necessary to have community meetings? After all, we have had some difficulties with these class actions and they're 
people, uh, you've explained it today, but uh, I would think that a small percentage of people are online watching this. And we have to consider those that do not understand and are not online. Uh, I think that, uh, so the, there had been some earlier inter, I guess, inter, inter office discussion internally here about who should be involved on kind of like a support network. Um, I think there's some lessons learned definitely from when we did the class action for the day school. Um, I know that, uh, the administration office often gets questions and say, could you please help us fill out this? Or what should I put here? Because even there was even a hard time about, um, they asked for Six Nations number. Is it is it Six Nations Indian Reserve number forty, or is it Indian Reserve number one two one? Like, just kind of uh, fundamental questions like that that um, people are uncertain about. But again, the the indication so far is that if the application is incomplete or it's missing something or something's not clear, they are pretty uh, rigorous in re responding and and reaching out to the applicant to tell them um, that they're missing information and and then they can go from there. But right now, as it stands, I'm not aware that there's any established uh, delegation um, internally at council that would be uh, have set aside, set aside time during regular business hours to help uh, residents fill out the application form. There is a, a video, uh, an online video on the, the website, and there's an instructional step-by-step -step guide as well, which I find is very helpful. But that this your suggestion, Councillor Melba, has certainly come up. In, in terms of um, those those households that do want extra help um, filling out the application, I just I just it hasn't been operationalized um, as of yet, as far as I know. Um, there might be some on, other folks online here that if we've got any traction on on that. I know there's some other class actions and as well, so there might be some lessons learned or some best practices that we've adopted um, that we could borrow for this in this instance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's just that there has been problems in the past and um, people have just recently received their applications back from um, the day schools, for example, and they too were asked to put more information in, especially when they have not cashed their check of 10000 So we need some correct, it sounds like we need correct information in this application so hopefully that'll be that'll be done in some manner thanks thanks melba um and before we move on we have nathan and then i have carrie on the line um so council will be doing an awareness campaign so it's not strictly we're live tonight and community can only hear about it we will be using the papers and try and, and getting that word out so individuals can apply um, and we will have likely a staff member here who's able to support community members, just like we did with the day school application. Nathan? Yeah, I was just going to update that that's likely our next ask of the um, class action is uh, to take advantage of those resources that are available by way of um, um, the background um, there is a website, firstnationsdrinkingwater.ca, where uh, you can uh, look at the information now. You can access the, the claims form, both online and in print. And there's also an assessment tool in there um, to utilize. Uh, but my understanding is this is a bit of a softer approach than what we're used to. Uh, and in addition to that, the administrator is sending out individuals to help communities or resources to help communities um, with those individuals. And the deadline, just to be specific, is March 7th, 2024. Thanks for searching that up, Nathan. Um, Kerry? Yeah, um, Rod, uh, if, if Six Nations name is not on the claim, how would the approval be for the individual claims that are, are going in now? Yeah, they do. They've been pretty forthright, and even the, the presentations that they, the law firm delivers, um, they do try to differentiate. And and I think there's even a notation. I'll have to look and see what page it's on. But it does basically say if you don't see your First Nation on uh, within the application form, 
don't worry, you can still um, submit as an individual. So um, they are pretty explicit about that throughout the application process. It's actually um, explained, I think, in act the actual settlement agreement, which I think is, I forget how many pages it is, but, um, and all, all the PowerPoint presentations that they've delivered um, at the Chiefs of Ontario and the Assembly of First Nations have, have all um, um, made, you know, clarified the fact that if your First Nation is not on here you, and you're an individual and you meet the criteria, you still can submit an application. So I think that was the confusion is because, because like I said, Six Nations, people perceive that it's only the village of Ashwigan, it's only the people on the water treated treatment plant and the, and the pipe system um, that, that are, that qualify for this compensation. And like I said, at the beginning is there's, there's never been a, a continuous period of time where the, th where the boil water advisory for people in Ashwigan has been over one year. And so that's why it, it seems to be, even the government seemed to want to dismiss Six Nations considerations for that very reason, not realizing that the vast majority of our community is not hooked up to the water treatment plant. We're not on, we're not on the pipe distribution system. We we still rely on groundwater. So that that no matter how many times we we have these discussions, um, it seems like we still have to drive home that message. And I think that was kind of the another um, primary purpose of the the blanket cover letter signed by the chief is just to drive that message home in writing with his signature, basically attesting that th this is the reality. So hopefully that goes, that, that clarifies uh, any, any um, confusion that the claims people might have or the lawyers might have or the government might have. Okay, thanks Rod. Thanks Rod, very thorough. So with that, um, Omela has a follow-up. Yeah, just a little more uh, concerning elders. Elders, as you know, have a different lifestyle than uh, we sitting around the table and some of the general population who are younger. And I think they need specific services. They don't reach out as much as, as other people to the general population. So if the services in the community could accommodate them and make them priority face to face with actually explaining what this is about, because that's what I had happen with uh, the day schools, they didn't even know a couple of them. So I imagine there's many more that did not know that this was happening. He needed one individual needed a new truck and he had to get a car because he didn't have enough money. And then after he's got his um, compensation, he got the truck that he needed. So I think we should concentrate on, on the elders more face to face. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melba. And so, like I said, Rod, thank you. You were very thorough in the background and where we stand now. So community members can apply. Um, Six Nations Council's administration team will be supporting our community members should they have um, need some help in filling out the application. So with that, can I have a mover and a seconder to accept Rod's presentation as information? I'll move. Thanks, Audrey. Second by Melba, all in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, perfect. And so that letter will be here within council administration. So moving along, we have now um, finished all our delegations for this evening, and we are looking to adopt the general council minutes of September 12th. Go ahead. Um, I'll move with just, um, there's uh, just one uh, correction on that, that, um, I think the general council minutes, uh, the date is uh, marked as um, September 26th. It should be September the 11th. The 12th, it's named the 12th, but yes, within the body of it, it needs to be corrected. So yes. they can do that. That's great. Well, Thanks, I'll, Greg, I'll. for moving. Do I have a seconder? Second by Audrey, all in favor? Those minutes are carried. Do we have any um, councillor reports for the last week? or since we met two weeks ago? Yeah, I think we went through our reports um, yesterday at Political Liaison. So scheduling um, for the community, just wanting the community to know that the Six Nations Grand River Development Corporation, they'll be hosting their annual fall festival on Saturday, October 21st 
at Chiefswood Park. So that's going to start at 11 and end at four o'clock. <laughs> they are seeking volunteers for the pie in the face. Mark and I did it last year and we both got hurt. So uh, somebody else could do it this year. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll go over and I'll do it too. Um, so yeah, they're seeking volunteers. They, uh, it's a 30 minute slot. So Nathan, you're willing, Greg, you're willing. Um, just like with a comment, um, <clears throat> it says there are, there are nine spots. So I just wanted to bring that forward. There are nine spots. We have what, nine counselors, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll volunteer. Okay, so we have three that have stepped up. I'm sure Chief Hill will go. Um, and then we have like Chief uh, Darren Mentor. They participate. And so Melville will even go. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's happening October 21st. So now we've got to your additional items, Greg. So over to you. Uh, yes, I just have uh, two announcements to make. Um, one is concerning the uh, drug strategy session, uh, healing together um, for the community. The community presentation will be postponed. Uh, the community decided that um, we'd like to give them more information and we thought that would be more helpful. So we're gonna rework that and also provide a new date for that uh, community presentation. So thank you. The second um, is of course on uh, Saturday. Um, well, it actually it was a pretty busy weekend. You know, with the walk the track, um, there's a lot going on in the at the Ball Diamonds, uh, Parks and Rec. Also, uh, we had the um, nominations on Saturday, and I'd like to congratulate all those that were nominated. Um, we'll. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement for the dates for the election, for the uh, the advanced voters poll. Uh, there are two: one on uh, Saturday, October the twenty first at the community hall from nine to two. Uh, there is the second on Saturday, October the 28th, uh, again at the community hall from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And of course, the uh, general voters poll will be on Saturday, November the 4th uh, from nine to six. And I wish all the nominees the best of luck and hope uh, everyone can get out and vote. Okay, thanks, Craig. Thanks for both updates, Melba. Yes, uh, we shouldn't be forgetting Orange Shirt Day, uh, which we're celebrating at the Woodland at the Cultural Center, the Mush Hole, uh, this Friday and Saturday. And the program will start at 10 o'clock. So we have uh, quite a few speakers and uh, Six Nations elected council. Mark Hill has been, been uh, invited to take part. So hopefully he's available. If not, hopefully someone else. Thank you. Thanks, Melba, and your mic there. And just to let to know, uh, let the community know, um, Canada Post and the Woodland Cultural Center they have actually collaborated, and they will be unveiling their uh, second annual stamp. That's tomorrow, so that's their event as well for National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So uh, that's the RSVP um, stamp launch tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so with that, Shirley. Okay. It's a drive through on September 29th at the Family Game Night Pack. While supplies last. Okay. And so we're also doing a family game night on Saturday, September 29th. There will be a drive through held at Oneida Business Park, and we will be giving away orange shirts that afternoon. What time does it start, Shirley? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. until supplies run out. And so um, that will be promoted on our um, application, I mean, our app, our SNGR app, as well as on Facebook. So with that, that's all the items I have for tonight's agenda. Do I have somebody who's willing to adjourn the meeting? Moved by Melva, second by Audrey, all in favor. Thank you, community, for watching. And uh, again, come see administration if you need the letter. Take care. So we all have the letter now. Thanks, Daryl. We're good to go.
So five minutes. Uh, Brooke, uh, Brooke, you're hosting right now. Uh, might need to get you to. So Brooke, can you give Daryl hosting rights so he can go off live? Okay, 10 minutes and then we'll go into in camera.